Hi guys, welcome to the last topic in chapter 8. I know we've had a lot of concepts for chapter 8, and so this one hopefully will be a little bit easier. It's a little bit more of an application chapter. It should hopefully, hopefully explain some of the things that we're doing in lab this semester to you. So in chapter 8 we're going to talk, all, or in topic 5 of chapter 8, we're going to talk about genetic engineering. So why is this topic important? This is all about how we actually study microbes in their genomes. This is what we do in microbiology labs around the country. This is also how we can use these cells to manipulate them in biotechnology ways to produce desired outcomes. So while there's a whole range of genetic engineering out there, being that this is an introductory microbiology class, we're only caring about three types of genetic engineering. This is the use of enzymes, the DNA analysis, and recombinant DNA technology. So those are the only three we're going to worry about here. When you take other classes, you'll learn about all sorts of other techniques, but these are just the three cornerstone techniques that we use in micro. So first of all, important enzymes in genetic engineering. The first tool we use are called restriction endonucleases. What these do is they can cut the DNA open so that we can insert genes or cut out genes within a segment, within a plasmid or within the genome, whatever it is that we're trying to manipulate. There are a whole range of these enzymes, these restriction endonucleases. They can do a variety of things and they can cut in a variety of places. And you can see the different cutting patterns here on this slide. We have the blunt, which is the last one here on the slide, it's the HAE3. And then you have the sticky ends, which are the staggered cuts. And those just provide different ways of us, to, of allowing us to be able to cut things and add things in. Now, each of these enzymes and the, all the other ones that aren't listed all have unique cutting patterns, but they all look for the same thing, which is called a palindrome. A palindrome is where the sequence is the same when read from 3 prime to 5 prime on one strand and from 5 prime to 3 prime on the other strand. If you look at echo R1, you can see that here. The top strand goes AATT when the bottom strand goes TTAA. So you can see how that's a palindrome. So that's how that works. So really when it comes to these restriction enzymes, the big thing I want you to understand is that they cut the DNA in a specific place using a palindrome and in, by selecting which one of these we use, we can either cut DNA into a whole bunch of little fragments for analysis or be able to add in genes to plasmids or whatever our application process is. So if we cut that DNA up into little fragments, we can then run them on a gel using a technique called electrophoresis, which you should be exposed to later in lab this semester. Electrophoresis separates DNA by segments because the gel is kind of like a it's kind of like a matrix. So the big pieces don't get through very fast, the small pieces get through really fast. If we were to take a whole series of samples, cut them using the same restriction enzymes, we would be able to see how similar they are because of the different sizes of fragments, because those enzymes would cut in the same place every time. This is actually how we do outbreak testing. So when samples are brought into the lab, either stool or food testing, we isolate out the organisms, cut up their DNA, run it on a gel and look to see if they're the same or not. If they're the same, then this item is associated with the outbreak. If they're not the same, then they're, um, then it's a new different organism that's causing a problem or it's just a random side that we caught up. It just, it depends. We can also use it for sequencing, but we're not going to worry about that too much here. Another application analyzing DNA is called polymerase chain reaction, PCR. When we have DNA, and if we only have a very little bit of DNA, we have to make huge amounts of copies in order to be able to analyze it. We can't analyze microscopic amounts. We have to get bigger amounts. And so polymerase chain reaction allows us to make those copies that we can then do with electrophoresis or do other applications with. So the last thing in this topic is recombinant DNA technology. And we've talked about this throughout the whole course. I think even in our first topic lecture, we talked about recombinant DNA technology. And the hallmark example we use in microbiology is the use of E. coli to produce human insulin for diabetics. And how do we do this? So the first thing we do is we identify the gene that we of interest. So in this case, it's human insulin. We've identified the gene and we put that into a plasmid. Once we have this in the plasmid, we then insert it into our desired cell, which in this case was E. coli, and then we let the E. coli grow. And we can stimulate the production of it if it's not naturally stimulated, have it produce these proteins, and then we can isolate out the proteins and purify them.
And so that's how this process works. And you can see a little schematic of it here. What I'm really looking for in this is I want you to understand the basic concepts. By all means, the hardest part of this process is identifying the gene and getting it correctly into the plasmid. That is always the hardest part, is making sure you get the whole gene, make sure you're getting the functional parts of the gene, and getting that nicely set in that plasmid so that the cell can easily read it and create that protein. So that's the hardest part. Once you have the rest of it, it's all easy and downhill from there. So this was a short topic lecture on some genetic engineering, but let me know if you have any questions about it. I know it's a little assay based, so it's a little different, so if you're struggling with that, that's okay. And just let me know if you have any questions.